Brainy Brains. How you doing? You're at the spot, the place, the location. With the conversations appointed, the guests are sharp. The responses are never dull. Today, we have Catherine, known as Cat Griffin, with us here on the edge. She's a licensed clinical social worker. I'm going to ask her a little bit about that, but more so, I'm going to ask her about clarity and transformation. Love I it. get people on my show all the time talking about this transformation. Okay, so what you going to turn me into, a frog? <laughs> Let's hope not. Really. I want to know what, what people's <laughs> understanding of that is, because it's a lot to put in that container. You look at culture, you look at you know, gender identity, you look at socioeconomics, you look at parenting, epigenetics, and then to take all of that and then transform a person. And on top of that, help that person understand who they are once they've been transformed. Okay, to get that clarity. So we're going to talk to Kat about that and a whole lot more. Let's welcome her to the show. How are you, Queen? I am amazing. I've been a little sick this week, but... I am up and moving and happy today, so I am so glad to be feeling better and here with you. I'm glad, too. I came back from Thailand, and I tell you, uh, I tested positive for that cotton-picking COVID. After all this time, I had not gotten it, and it was strange um, because I just kind of had this coughing and phlegm in my chest, respiratory. It wasn't super bad, but I could only imagine the people that had gotten it super bad. I don't yeah. get sick too often. Do you get sick often these days? I don't get sick. You too know, often. fun fact about me, I have had a kidney transplant wow. and yeah. And so that's part of my journey as a matter of fact, but um, the medications that keep you from rejecting an organ, their sole purpose is to knock out your immune system. So yes, <laughs> I get sick way more than I used to. And it's so really? frustrating. I joke around that if it's in the County, I'm going to catch it. Wow. And well, I'm like an it. active person, so I don't like to be sick. And this time I was like in bed for days. <laughs> well, I bless you and the person that gave you the kidney. I've got a friend that is, um, and it's different now. You know, I did a whole show on it. My two co-workers, quick story, Brain, since we're on the subject. My two co-workers, yeah. one was a, a woman from the Caribbean and another young uh, Filipino and Hispanic mixed young woman. She came into work and she says... I'm just so upset. And the other employee says, well, what's wrong? She says, I need a kidney. She said, you can have one of mine. But this is the odd part. She had a twin sister and my friend, it was Allison and, and Farah. Allison donated the kidney. She was a better match than Farah's twin sister. What? That is crazy. Yeah. Now let's ask you something. I'm gonna go into this a little bit deeper since yeah. you opened up Pandora's box. I did. And I don't want you to necessarily relate it to your person and you transplanted, but you know what I found? I found that there was a an emotional um uh, an emotional commitment, and then the other person felt like they were held emotionally host uh uh hostage because of that situation. <laughs> You know, you know, because it's like, I've given you a part of me. Yeah. And there's kind of this underlying expectation that you will be always oh, friends with me, loyal to me, beholden to me. I've given you life. I, I, I don't know. It's a whole thing. Are they overthinking that? Or is that just human nature? No, I think, I think there is an element to that. There is, um, especially when there's a live donor that you know. Um, they do a lot of pre-transplant counseling and interviews galore for that reason to really flush out, is this voluntary? Is this something you feel like you should do? Is that, you know, all of the psychological things you have to go through psychological testing. I'm sure it depends on the state, but, um, yeah, so I actually had two, <laughs> And the first one was my half sister that I'm not blood related to. So, so yeah, it's, it's very much an emotional two, thing for sure. You had two daughters or you had two transplants? Two transplants. Yeah. Wow. So the second one, ironically, was someone from California. I'm 
pretty sure it was someone who had had an accident young and healthy. I knew that much. And that's all I know at this point. So, um, so yeah, the first one went well, but my body, I had a blood that killed the kidney. So in a matter of six days, I got a kidney, I lost a kidney. So yeah, that was quite a crazy traumatic kind of six day period of my life. Um, what was your, what was your recovery? Like, was it a long time? Three months, about yeah. three months. Mm -hmm. And look yeah. at you, you're, you got great color and your hair and your eyes are bright. There's a calling on your life, cat. For I sure. You know that, for sure you know? is. Yeah. There's a calling on your life. So oh, I know that. <laughs> about how you show up in the world uh, and what you're doing and what you're pouring into others. Okay. Um, so I, um, that was right after I went back to graduate school. So there was a period of when my kidney started to fail, I had a bunch of health stuff happen and I decided to go back to graduate school <laughs> because what else are you going to do when you think you're dying? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I went to graduate school. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Um, and so I got my master's in social work. I had trained horses before that. That was wow. my, like, I, I was passionate about training horses. I knew I was going to do it for the rest of my life. And when my health started failing, I had to figure something else out. So I was sick for a while and then I went back to grad school. And, um, so when I got my master's in social work, I, decided to go into counseling and I worked in a women's substance use rehabilitation center for seven and a half years and loved it. It was one of the things I said I would never do. And of course, that's exactly what I ended up doing because <laughs> there are often other plans that I did not sign off on. So <laughs> right, 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 right. right. <laughs> so, um, I did that. And then, um, I dabbled in the online business space through that. And then four years ago, I got a job at a different place, still working with women with substance use issues um, in a nonprofit. But I decided a few years ago that I really, I known all along, I have just had this pull to do something bigger, to do something louder, um, mm. just knew that there was something else I was supposed to be doing. And that's what brought me into uh, the coaching space as well, because wow. I apparently, you know, I, I kind of joke about it, like, you know, okay, I'm a therapist. Now it's time to add to the list. So right. um, now, now what is the difference? Okay. Because I want, I want you to yeah. create, uh, you know, create the, the, the lanes for a counselor versus a coach. Yeah. It's a great question. And there's a very fine line, I will say that. Um, the difference really for sure is training, right? Like I had to go to school, I had to go study a lot and do a lot of work. Um, ironically, most life coaching is loosely based on cognitive behavioral therapy. So when I say there's a fine line, there's a pretty fine line. Um, <clears throat> I have been very careful to keep them separate for me. And what that means for me is I don't go into mental health in my coaching. If they need mental health services, I will refer because I'm not being a therapist in that space. And legally I cannot, um, I cannot be a, someone's coach and therapist at the same time. Also, therapy is heavily regulated. So I can only provide therapy for people who are in the state that I am licensed in. Okay. Okay. Coaching, I can coach anyone anywhere. Because I'll tell you, just from my experience, I only coach five people a year and I only coach for five hours. But I find that it turns more into quote unquote kind of therapy. And yeah. I try to say, you know what? No. Or the girlfriend situation. Girl, let me tell you, uh-uh. No, 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 no. <laughs> we are, we are going to get through this. I'm a taskmaster. I want you to do this. I want to see some results because I don't want you to come back at me and say, oh, I didn't do what you said you were going to do, or <clears throat> you don't see the results. And I want you to outgrow me. 
I want you to be able to put things in your toolbox, just like a counselor or a therapist. Mm -hmm. I say this with love to all psychiatrists out there. I do. So my uh, friend has been seeing a psychiatrist for about, I think she said like 10, 12 years. And I'm saying to myself, in my, I'm saying in my mind, you lived 20 years through this and now you're still talking about it for 10 or 12 years. When are we going to yeah. find some results? I'm not judging. You may need yeah. it the rest of your life. But I'm thinking at a certain point, shouldn't there be some sort of change, evolution, resolution. transformation, resolution? Shouldn't there be? I, I don't know. Sure. I'm just assuming. Well, what's interesting, too, about like what people do, psychiatrists test and meditate. That's all psychiatrists do. Psychologists will do counseling, therapy, all the things, diagnosing. Clinical social workers also diagnose. We don't medicate. Um, uh, licensed practicing clinical therapists, LCPC is the initials. They also do therapy, but like psychiatrists are doctors to medicate. That's their purpose. Okay. And so people get, a lot of people don't have a clue who they go to, who does what. And so they expect their psychiatrist to spend time talking to them. No, they're in and out like any other doctor. So, so it's interesting when you hear things like that. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, no, you don't know. So right. you're at this place in your life and you find that you have these health challenges and you go back to school and you say, I'm going to revamp myself. I'm going to transform. What was your aha moment? What was the, 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 the point of realization that this is, you know, this is my happy space. This is what I found that I really want to do because you're doing a lot of heavy lifting. You're working with people that have substance abuse issues, which is a challenge within themselves. You're working with right. women. <laughs> That's a challenge within itself. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're dealing with your own personal stuff, but you're also a licensed clinical social worker. You're taking on a lot of things. And for some reason, I look in your eyes and I see a bit of an empath. Are you empathic? You know, it's so funny that you asked that question. So I have had so many people come to me. Yes, is the answer. Um, and it's also part of my human design. I don't know how much you know about human design, oh, but what? you like human design. Okay. So the other piece though, especially working with women with substance use issues, a lot of women have come to me and said, I'm an empath. And I'm like, nope, you have no emotional boundaries. That's not empath. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, oh, well, so, right. <laughs> and so being able to connect with other humans in a deep, deep way and just feeling everyone's everything and not having any clue how to deal with it, those are not the same thing. But it took me a long time to get there to actually recognize like I can set an emotional boundaries and I can feel other people's emotions deeply and still help them. It's a dance for sure. It is. And it, it's not the cha-cha, it's straight up the tango. <laughs> yes, that is because for sure. And I trip on my skirt all the time. <laughs> it is, but you know what? Um, it's an elegance to it. And I thank you for that because you could have just, you know, kept it all to yourself. But working well, with others... That. Is that therapeutic for you as well? I believe it is. I believe it keeps me connected to our humanness. It also keeps me very freaking humble. Mm. Knowing, I often say, people would ask me early on, they don't ask me anymore. But when I was working in the Women's Treatment Center, I wasn't even thinking about going into coaching or anything at that point. And people would say, how do you do that? How do you hear the stories? The level of trauma that I hear is mind blowing under any circumstance. And so uh, less so in my job now than in the treatment center, but still some. Um, and how do you do that? You know, those kinds of incredulous questions. Right. And I would say there, but for the grace of God, go I. Like it's it's one decision at 16. They kept me from being this woman in front of me who experienced all, all these horrible things. 
and uses to cover it up. So, so I think that just like maintaining that I learned from every client coaching or therapy, um, whether it's not myself or them, something I, I might've really screwed something up and I learn about that. Or like, I'm able to learn just from that other human sitting in that space with me. Um, but whatever it is, I, I believe that's it. I think it keeps me connected. I think it keeps me human. And I think that that's what is able to help people. Is that your love language? I think it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've known this. It's funny when, whenever I went back to school, cause you know, I also got the question, why does a horse trainer go to school for social work? <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and my answer to that is if you're dealing with competition animals, their owners, their teenage daughters, and their, you know, attachment to their animal, you're already a social worker, trust me. <laughs> and so- but it's, your, it's your level of communication that's on a different frequency because, again, I'm intimidated by horses. Okay? Yeah. Absolutely. One, did I tell you the story how the one ran away with me? No. Girl, I got on the I got all cute, had my boots on, my hat, girl. We out at the we're out at the stables in Burbank, California. And I'm just, you know, thinking I'm doing this. I got on the back of that puzzy. <laughs> and she went nuts. And I guess she could feel something. And she gal. I mean, you know, not just a nice oh, I, I was like, one of those little beach walks, whatever. No, she got a gallop on her. And I'm doing like this on the back. You have no idea what you're doing. No, no. And they were saying, okay, just your legs just need to be tight on her. But there's so much to a horse. You know, it, you're, supposed oh, yeah. to, you're supposed to grip your legs or your thighs and make them tight. When she finally stopped, I got off that You were saddle. still on? I, I, I hung on for dear life. And I was Good for you. Rain, but I was scared to pull too hard on the reins because before I got on, I saw the bit in her mouth. And I didn't like that. I don't like that. I don't know what that's about. You know, it's about the training, but I just didn't like it. Which is, of course, what you needed to do to stop her. Okay. Well, I didn't want to mess with her. Okay. And so I got some sugar cubes and some carrots and I loved her up. And I said, come on, let's walk back. <laughs> wow. Good for you. I have, not been on a, I have not been on a horse since. Aww. However, I just came from Thailand and I had a, a, a fondness for the elephants. And I felt a oneness with them. And I looked deeply into their eyes. And just the way that they parent, the way that they they communed I as a, a family. It was it was beautiful. And I could feel that. So I understand again the love language with animals. And to work with horses, they are one of the most intelligent yeah. species on the planet. You know, and you have to have a certain way to because they look at you a certain way too. They can tell a lot. They're very smart. Mm -hmm. Did you have horses growing up as a child? No. So my parents divorced when I was five and I was a horse crazy kid. And so the kind of the way that I dealt with my childhood was um, I got riding lessons. And then when I was 16, I bought my own horse. Wow. I got a job and I just saved up and I bought a horse and I trained it. So that was kind of the start of all of that. Um, it was, horses were my survival more than something that I grew up with. I didn't live on a farm, never lived on a farm, yes, never had the a animals. Lot of, a lot of therapies are using animals. Yeah. I had another guest that has a, uh, I'm going to turn you on to her too. You might want to meet yeah. her. Uh, but uh, they have a horse ranch where okay. they work with people that have experienced trauma um, tragic loss, they're in grief or substance abuse. And they find that, you know, even in prisons now, they have where the prisoners are training the dogs. Yep. There's I something love those about programs. that is something about those uh those moments yeah. that you share, the nonverbal, or I shouldn't say nonverbal because it's a different type of communication that really yeah. elevates you to a different level. What would you say to a person that's struggling? right now that is in the thralls of you know um thinking some ugly thoughts maybe an abusive relationship maybe substance abuse but somebody that's struggling that's just teetering on the edge what would you say to them right now 
Ooh, that's a tough one. Cause you know, like you have to really find out some things first. I would ask a bunch of questions before I said anything. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the time in those situations, people are not feeling heard. So especially if they're in an abusive situation, they're being used in a lot of ways and their voice does not matter. And so creating spaces for people like that is the very first step. Um, safety is important. So if someone's in an abusive situation, like telling them to get out of a situation right away actually puts them in more danger. So right, right, right. you really want to create more of a safety plan with them. Like, can you have these information, your birth certificate, your a copy of your driver's license, uh, 10 bucks somewhere where it's not known to be? Like, you know, those kinds of things are what you do in those situations. But just like struggling in just letting people talk. <laughs> You're not going to fix anything in a day or one statement. There's no magic, anything. You right. want to find out if people are safe. If they're on the verge of self-harm, I'm going to escort them to the hospital. <laughs> like I'm going to make sure they're safe before anything else. Right. Um, worth. How do you feel about con consistency overall? That is a challenge that us as human beings struggle with. Yeah. It's like me. I said, Especially I'm, right now. I'm not gonna have I'm not gonna have any sugar. Ah. Calling me, April, come, you know, have some sugar. Or, you know, I'm not going to watch television, or I'm going to read, or I'm going to work out. How do we stay consistent? How do we to, to work a, a mindset? Because you're working with people that are in recovery. And, Hopefully. <laughs> right. And again, it's not day by day it's moment by moment heck yeah heck yeah um first of all you got to get the things that pull you out of your environment mm. that's number one i was i was actually i lost some weight a few years ago and i joke that um i needed someone else to do for me what i do for other people so i joined noom which is a psychology based uh weight loss program and I remember learning the, the studies about why people break habits or, you know, fall short of their goals or whatever. And the number one reason people eat things they say they don't want, they see it. Mm. It's just there. <laughs> I mean, it's so simple, right? No. So, well, like so yeah. I had a bad habit and I'm, I'm breaking it. Uh, every time I get in the car, I feel like I've got to go get something to eat. I go to Costco, I spend $400. I've got food galore, everything from tacos to filet mignon. In the back seat, and you're driving in the drive through And I'm driving to the drive through And so what I had found was it was a pattern. Mm -hmm. When I meet a client, oh, let's go to a restaurant. You know, when I'm in the car with my daughter, we're going somewhere. Instead of eating before we leave or looking forward to eating when I get home, you yeah, know, right into a restaurant or mm -hmm. whatever. But what's getting we're me out of the phone now? Well, and it's the television. I, you turn on the TV and every other thing is something to eat. But oh. now what's breaking the habit is the cost of going out to eat. Oh, there you go. Tracking it. I'm not really. I'm Oh, honey. I've been tracking it for a long time. Well, you know, with a business, it could be a tax write-off. But I'm like, <laughs> this is this is a bit much. And another thing that annoys me is everywhere you go, there's a tip jar. I'm at the 7-Eleven getting gas, and there's a tip. What am I tipping you for? <laughs> I'm looking at that. So now I've changed. So I, I started reading Atomic Habits. Have you read oh, that? Oh, good. I was just about to ask that. So good. I love it. And so now yeah. I'm combining new habits. Good. And I'm locking out old habits. Matter of fact, I'm okay. gonna, you know, go and get the audio version of it again. But again, it's staying consistent. Yeah. And I think that's that's what it is. And not being triggered by, like you said, seeing seeing it. Okay. Yep. Well we have is. too much access. Yeah. So yeah, that's the problem. But what's interesting about that is um well, let me share this. I remember there was a comedian. I don't remember who it was. I want to say 
Chris Rock maybe, um, who was talking about how literally none of us is ever more than five minutes away from a snack. <laughs> like no matter where we're driving, no matter where, like in other countries, you have to walk 10 blocks to the, you know, nope, we just have to go to the corner or it might be right downstairs. Like we always have snacks within reach and that's the problem. Right. And, and we keep snacks? buying them and then they're sitting in our house. We don't even have to get up anymore. <laughs> Please. You don't. You don't. So. You know, but it, it's your wants and your desires. And you have to figure out, are you eating to live, living to eat, or are you eating for entertainment? Yeah. And that's what right. my friend asked me. She said, are you eating for entertainment? And I was like, I love it. Baby, <laughs> you know, I am. Because I'm already being entertained. I'm watching Netflix. Do I actually have to have, you know, the chips, the guacamole and the margarita and a refill? <laughs> and the pitcher right next to me? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, so, it's so true. About, you're thinking about starting a podcast. I am what thinking is, about what it. What is the premise of that? Tell me, what, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to share? You know, that that's actually why I haven't started it because I have so many things I want to talk about. Um, I remember I was walking in the mountains last year in Colorado and um I had done a training and I I remember all of these people judging like people who use heroin people who use drugs whatever and I actually wanted to write a book or do a podcast about people who have gone who have survived overdoses and gone on to do amazing things mm. so that's one topic Another topic I want to cover is, um, and I don't have a title for this one, of course. And I'll, th this is me just throwing out how my brain that's, works. And that's, and that's what you do. You got to brainstorm. You got to throw everything yeah. against the wall yeah. and see what yep. sticks. Because with this, you want longevity. Right. I've done this yeah. for 22 years. I opened it up to be a variety show. That Love way, that. you know, but the, the, the nucleus of it is the person. And people that have overcome, you know, yep. and I can't even imagine, you know, uh, an overdose because again, that's, I don't think that that's anything well, that's premeditated, but you're right. hurting, you're in a space so bad, yeah. you know, that, and now people are overdosing on marijuana brains. Yes. Yeah. I bring that to your attention because, you know, weed is the new, you know, it's the oh, new yeah. shot of coffee, you know, it, it's the new cigarette. <laughs> It's the new I, cigarette. Illinois passed social use after California did. And I remember walking down the block in California and being like, where is that coming from? Oh, it's everywhere. And everywhere. now they're, they're it, the spaces aren't like that here. But when a person walks in a store and you're like, oh my God, I think I just got contact high. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's but, a big uh, thing. My, my husband, did, we just came in the house from the grocery store and he goes, oh, the neighbors are blowing it up. And it's so, it's so, uh, you know, it, it's just different. And people, uh, they got it confused. They got it twisted. Well, but it's, it's, you know, it's a whole industry now. Yep. So you have to yep, take that into consideration too. Sure. Tolerance and boundaries. Um, talk to us a little bit about setting some boundaries. Okay. This is actually favorite topics because I had to learn it. I'm a child of an alcoholic. And so um, I did not have boundaries in my family growing up. I had to learn them as I went and working in a women's rehab. <laughs> if you have ever had to learn boundaries, work with women who have just gotten clean within days before being in your presence. <laughs> I used to joke that those women smelled weakness and I was the giver of all. And so I had, I had to learn some boundaries, let me tell you. Um, but the beautiful thing about that is it's the scare for someone who doesn't know how to do it. It is the deepest sense of resistance. It is the fear of making other people mad. The fear it's so deeply rooted in fear. Um, the people, the not setting boundaries with people, um, the desperate need for love and attention. And so there's this constant grabbing for love and attention from people. 
and feeling walked on all the time. Often people who don't set boundaries are <clears throat> filled with resentment about being used by their life. And so um, learning to set boundaries is a very hard first step. Just starting with no, no, I can't do that for you. Or no, I don't want that, that right, is, right now. That's a complete sentence, Brains. <laughs> oh yeah, because that's the first thing they do. They say, no, but here's why. Like they explain and explain and explain, right? Like that's the first step. Like that's the first no you've ever shared is always filled with explanation. <laughs> it's a very long process to get to no as a full sentence. Not for any reason other than I'm just not going to do that right now. Um, so yeah, setting boundaries is a really difficult, challenging thing for people to do. Many times women, but not always. Um, and finding ways to create situations where you can build confidence, build self-esteem, build, you know, self-worth, and then start like, you got, you got to start small with any change. You know that you're reading that book, right? You got to start with little things and reward yourself for those little things and build on it. And that's, right. that's really how you do it. And reward and recognize as you go through the phases. Yeah. Because I don't want to, you know, people, you can say it's vain, conceited, you can say whatever you want to say. But I yeah. will pat myself on the back. I don't wait for other people. If I did a good job, I'm like, girl, yes. reward yourself with something. A damn and that's snake. The other, that's the <laughs> other trait. We don't reward ourselves much. And we feel guilty for doing it. No. And well, so we, and that's been that's been a society norm. Oh, yep. don't do this and don't do that and don't be braggadocious. Yeah. Right. I will reward myself, but like I said, it's with the damn snack. Oh, let's yep. go out and get something to eat. Let's go have a cocktail. Let's go get yeah. on that other top. So now what I do is I reward myself with stars. Ooh, you know okay. the stars that you used to get when you were in elementary school? Like stickers? Like, exactly. With, and I have them up here. I, I have five it. goals. I have five goals that I need to reach every day. Uh -huh. And I look on there and I give myself a star. And if I don't get that star, Kat, you would think I was back in elementary school. I'm so disappointed because I let That's myself awesome. down. And I, and I hold true to self. I can't wait for outside validation. Yeah. If you have the expectation of other people to serve you, you got to teach people how to treat you. But if you don't know how to treat yourself good. Right. Yes. You know, That's you're exactly behind the eight ball. So let's <laughs> ask you some fun questions because you look like a fun kind of girl. Well, if you weren't I'm doing this fun. and training horses, what would you be doing? What would be Kayaking doing? all over Asia. Wow. Yep. That's my goal. I want to go to Asia, the whole continent, starting wow. with Indonesia, I think, just because of pictures I've seen. And I want to kayak all over the, that continent. Well, that is that is definitely something to do. I've been to about four or five countries in Asia, and it is probably one of my favorite. I don't know if I like Europe most. Italy, Italy is my favorite place on the planet. Yeah. But Asia is amazing, and um, it, it's a lot to learn. It's a lot to I learn: bet. mind, body, spirit, diet, everything. If you were a car, what kind of car would you be? Ooh. Huh, what kind of car would I be? I mean, there's days I'd be not a Porsche. That's too bougie. I would probably be oh, girl, like, go a, ahead, bougie. <laughs> I, well, I would be a sports car for, for some days. I would be a sports car for sure. Maybe an Acura NSX or something kind of under the radar, but really damn fast. But other days I'd be an old beat up pickup truck, truthfully. And yeah. I would just be like tooling around the countryside and my beat up self, you know, the paint's kind of peeling. <laughs> that, I got a little good. of all of that in me. If you were an appliance in the kitchen, what appliance would you be? Ooh. Now here I'll go all out bougie. I would be like the coolest coffee maker that makes all the coffees. Oh, you'd be like an, an espresso or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Coffee maker. All right. Great, great. I would uh be the refrigerator. Oh yeah? I Why is wanna, that? I just want chill. 
<laughs> well, see, with the like the fancy coffee maker, I'm a specialty item and I make people smile. They absolutely want what I provide. And then you have the froth on the top. Oh, mm-hmm. absolutely yes. wonderful. If you I could time it. travel, if you could go back to the past, if you could stay here in the present or project to the future, where would you land? Or project to the future. Well, I don't know about the future. Um, I have so many thoughts on this. I There's many reasons I would not go back to this time. This is purely a fashion decision. I would go to the <laughs> 40s. I would go to the 40s because they had my haircuts. And they wore the cute clothes, the flapper dresses. And they mm-hmm. were fun dancers. Okay, I can see that in you. I can see that. I'm going straight to three thousand. I I don't. Want Are to you? Do oh, honey, been there, done yeah. that. Got the T-shirt. I don't want to relive yeah. that again. There's nothing yeah. that. There's nothing I want to change. Everything is progressing forward. Right here in I'm the present, that. it's a good space. But if I could just go straight, straight forward, I would definitely go there. Three thousand. What do you expect to see in three thousand? How they make love. <laughs> all right are they just touching foreheads are they you know you know are you are you tapping your tapping on the computer is ai making love for you um oh i want to see again it's got to be the one thing that stays the same exactly. it has to be you know what i want to see um i want to see some something different than racism sexism yes classism. thank uh, you see, thank I you thank see you something different than people looking at me just because of what they assume. I want a forward progressive person that is excited about intellect and what's out there in the galaxy. Yeah, this, this, yeah, I'm going to the future. I'm so with you there. I'm not sticking around. And that was on the list of why I don't want to go back because hell, it's hard enough now. I can't even imagine. I don't want to see that that stuff. Uh, What would you say to a 25 year old Kat Griffith? Oh, I would tell her to keep moving forward, to know her worth, and to travel, travel more. (laughs) Um, 25-year-old cat, most definitely, I would tell her that she is going to be okay. There were many times that that was not clear. And I want her to know that. All right. Well, good. Tell my brains how to get in contact with you. I'd love for them to follow you um, because we're going to prepare you because you're going to be calling me more and I'm going to get you all prepped up for this podcast. All Um, right. Talking to these amazing people. And cool. you know what else I feel? Because I get these downloads. I feel that you're going to write something or you're going to do something audibly. I don't Ooh. know. I don't know what that is. I don't know if you're going to do an audible book, but Ooh. you're going to do something and it's not going to be really thick. It's going to be something that's fun, entertaining, but user friendly, really yeah. easy to deal with. So I see that. So we want to stay in contact with you because yes. that's old. You're going to say that doggone April. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm down. I'm here for it. Let's just say that. Um, so how you get hold of me on uh, Facebook, I'm Kathleen Griffith. I think it's dot five, four or something like that. Um, I have a Facebook group called empowered entrepreneurs, creating impact. Um, my big thing is impact. It's part of the course I wrote. It's part of everything I talk about. I'm a social activist in many realms and impact is everything for me. Um, so that's my group. I'm on Instagram, Soulful Ambitions with Cat Griffith, I believe. Soulful Ambitions is my company, by the way. And how else? I'm on LinkedIn. And if you want to check out my website, it's mysoulfulambitions.com. All right. Well, we're going to put all the links uh, to how to get in contact with you. Brains. Go in, you check your eyes, you check your nose, you check your business, check your brain. (laughs) Check in with a licensed clinical psychologist. If you have substance 
issues, if you are on the precipice of self-harm, reach out, talk to someone, know that life is worth living, yep. that you can do amazing things because you got a testimony. You got Amen. a testimony. And so share that with somebody. Hold somebody's hand. Be your sister's keeper, okay? And we encourage that on the edge. I love you deeply and completely from the bottom of my socks because my heart just isn't deep enough. How about that? <laughs> Continue to do great things like love, like, share, and subscribe. Go in, love, like, share, and subscribe. Help me raise those numbers. I look forward to following you, being with you, and uh, supporting you, Kat Griffith. Thank you for being with me on the edge. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, Bruce.